Okay, so the recording is happening. Um, I don't know where you are, but my family is all down in Canberra on the south side and all a bit worried about the, the fires around Canberra today. And the smoke here is just terrible. It's ghastly. Okay, well, we're looking at topic nine, responsibility accounting. and performance evaluation. So I hope you're all keeping safe. So let's see what topic nine says. So what we're looking at is um, how decision-making responsibility and authority relate to a performance evaluation. Because what we're what we're going, what we're doing is we're looking at costs and we're looking at management accounting, and what we want to do is to make sure that everyone is doing what they need to do to maximise the return for the business. And part of doing that is to um, set up some decision-making responsibility so that the people who are responsible for those decisions act in a way that's best. Um, is, is the best for the biz business and their performance is evaluated appropriately. Okay, so we're going to be looking at the different sorts of responsibility centres and how they're used to measure and monitor and motivate performance. And we're going to look at some um, financial measures of uh, achievement different from the profit measure. So these are, we're looking at ways in which we can measure the performance of a business over and above profit. So when we're looking at responsibility accounting, we've got to think about decision making authority and responsibility. And this changes as an organisation grows and becomes much more difficult for an individual manager. Oh, hi, my lad. Nice to see that you could join us. So, as I was saying, um, it becomes really difficult for managers to maintain control over very large organisations. Um, so we disperse decision making. We set up groups. We set up departments. We, we set up all these different ways of dispersing the decision making. Um, and in doing so, we need to measure the decisions, monitor them, and motivate the employees to make good decisions. So this is this is really what we're looking at in this week and next week: how we how we motivate or demotivate people making decisions. Um, and it varies whether or not we've got um, centralised or decentralised organisations one of the variables. And with a centralised organisation, obviously management um, and responsibility resides at the top. Decentralised, you've got um, decision making authority at a number of different levels of the organisation. So do you, this is a question over to you, do you work in a centralised or a decentralised organisation? I can see that Alicia and Malad are both typing something. Alicia, you work in a centralised organisation and Malad, you work in a decentralised organisation. Well, sometimes in centralised organisations, depending upon the size, it can take a long time to make a decision because it always has to go up the chain of authority. In a decentralised organisation, you can speed up um, decision making and that's one of the pop, one of the good things about a decentralized organization it it's also helps when we talk about the sort of knowledge that the the, the decision makers have um, and if you have a look at figure 16.1 that gives you advantages and disadvantages of centralized and decentralized organization 
And that's, that's the sort of question that could easily come up in a multiple choice question. So make sure you have a look at that figure, 16.1. When we're looking at centralised and decentralised organisations, we need to consider the, the sort of knowledge that the people have. Now, top management has general knowledge about the operations, but doesn't necessarily have the, the specific knowledge that the individual business segment managers have. And this can be where mistakes are made because top management in a centralised organisation might make a decision that would not have been made by the people with the specific knowledge if it had been a decentralised organisation. So you need to think about um, what's going to happen. So that the, the specific knowledge held by business segment managers could be technical knowledge with the process, um, could be, um, whereas the top management might have knowledge about the volume of sales, the product prices, but not really have the technical knowledge of the process. So, what and again, now I'm giving you a question. What specific knowledge do you have in your organisation that you don't think that top management has? What sort of specific knowledge might you have that top management doesn't have? I can see you both typing something. Yes, more knowledge about day-to-day -day operations and client needs. That's that's a very common thing, Alicia. Yes, I see Milad still typing something. Yeah, knowledge of process. Okay, so now we move on to things that are changing that sort the way organisations operate. Um, Technology has changed things dramatically, even in the time that I've been working. Mind you, I'm pretty ancient, so I've been working for a long time. Um, we've, global communication is instantaneous, um, and the, the whole idea of computers um, has really changed and reduced the cost of business transactions, because we can have... Um, business-to-business -business, um, transactions that happen instantaneously virtually through a computer. Um, and organisations have become increasingly multinational to have a much greater, um, greater volume of clients, greater volume of sales. And th this again can change who's good at making the best decisions because we can have local country managers are more likely to have specific knowledge about the cultural and customer preferences and can often make better decisions whereas top management might not be able to do it. So we're always talking about decision making here and responsibility accounting is the accounting um, that assigns authority and responsibility of managers to subunits. And so it's measuring and evaluating their, their performance. When we're talking about their performance, we're talking very much about their decision making. And responsibility accounting is always based around the responsibility centres where the managers are accountable for specific types of operating activities. So what we can have a look at is this figure here, which will explain responsibility accounting more effectively. So when, and, and this is figure 16.2, and we're looking at different levels of responsibility centres, the sort of examples of these types of responsibility centres and 
then how the performance is measured. And we've been doing a lot on costs and budgets. So if a manager is responsible for the decision making mainly about the costs a centre um, accrues, then how well they maintain their budgets and keep their variances under control is a good performance measure of management's performance. So this is a good summary, this schedule here. So it's, it's worthwhile reading it carefully. And I'll go through each of the cost centres in that schedule in more detail. Um, we've looked at um, managers of cost centres. So now let's move on to the next one, which is a revenue centres. Here the manager is responsible for the revenue under their control, where managers are expected to maximise sales. So here they're going to be setting prices um, and gross revenues are going to be used as a performance measure. So a lot of organisations will treat their, their sales departments as revenue centres and reward their, um, their employees based on sales generated. It's a bit difficult when you've got situations like we possibly might have here in Australia where um, we may, may be going into a recession this year um, with a number of um, revenue centres closing down. I talked last week about Jeans West which is, um, which is closing or going into administration so it's, they're reducing their, their sales. So as a revenue centre um, it's going to be very hard for the managers of individual revenue centres or shops to actually um, to, to actually really be held that responsible for their particular sales. We then move on to what we call profit centres. Here managers have responsibility for generating both revenues and controlling costs. So they can determine prices, the sales mix and the inputs used. So a manufacturing division is an example of a profit centre um, because it has both um, revenue and cost centres inside it. And then we come to investment centres and this is, this is really the top level. So we've been going up through a, a hierarchy from cost centres um, to revenue centres, profit centres and investment centres. So within in the university here, each individual school would probably be considered a cost centre, um, whereas the um, vice chancellor would be the head of an investment centre, and there'd be various um, various things in between. So, what do you do? Do you work in um, a cost centre, a revenue centre, a profit centre? or an investment centre. Where do you think you would work, be working? In a cost centre. Thank you. What about you, Alicia? Do you've got a... A revenue centre, yeah. And I work for the school in a cost centre, yes. Okay, so... What we it can end up with with responsibility with responsibility centres is suboptimal decision making. And here we're talking about something called agency costs. The agency cost is let, you'll do some more of this in accounting theory. But we look at an organisation, a company, and the principal is the owner of the company. 
Okay, so the principal is the owner of the company. Now that's the shareholders, and they are a long way away from running the, running the company. They're usually quite distant from running the company. And so the agent of the principal is the, the management of the business. And what we can end up having is that the management of the business it might end up prioritising their own short-term interest rather than the principal's longer-term interests in the business. So the principal of the business, the owner of the business, wants to make long-term profits. But the management of the business might want to maximise their bonuses this year round and in doing that might make decisions that, um, that actually increase the short-term profit but decrease the long-term profit. So by increasing the short-term profit, they might not invest in assets that are going to increase long-term profit. And by um, not investing in these assets, their, their profit looks better and they would be measured on that profit and get a bonus based on that profit. So you can see um, how there can be a conflict and you've got to set up responsibility centres and measure performance of management in those responsibilities so you reduce what we call the agency cost the cost of the agent um, not doing what the um, principal would ideally want. So that's, that's the thing that we're really focusing on here. Um, and some of the measures we'll use, we'll look at, we'll, you'll see how they can have an impact on short-term management decision-making rather than long-term principle decision-making. There's been some great examples in that came out of the Banking Royal Commission because um, National Australia Bank um, based their remuneration for their management on short-term performance measures. But after the Banking Royal Commission, there was quite a number of changes to their um, to their remuneration model so that their bonuses were based more on customer outcomes, um, people management and delivery of an overall strategy. So you can see that that working, choosing me performance measures and often these are accounting measures can have a big impact on how a business is run. Okay, so we're looking to um, develop appropriate performance measures and reward systems. Now, in this, se this session tonight, we're going to be looking at three measures commonly used to evaluate investment centre performance. Here we're looking at investment centre performance, not cost centre performance. We actually looked at cost centre performance earlier on when we were looking at um, when we were looking at budgets and variants. That was effectively how we can measure cost centre performance. And this um, and um, revenue and profit centre performance we can measure through sales and we can measure through accounting profit. But now for measuring um, investment centre performance we're looking at three measures, return on investment, residual income and economic value added. And so these are the three measures that we expect you to be able to calculate. So return on investment, now this is simply the ratio of operating income to average operating assets. 
So what do we, how do we define operating income? It's earnings before interest and taxes, so EBIT, and operating assets includes cash, accounts receivable inventory, and the property and equipment used in producing the revenue. So we've got a formula. So we've got return on investment. So we've got operating income divided by average operating assets. So that's, that's pretty straightforward to calculate. But what we can do is do something called a DuPont analysis, where we break these down and we take our revenue and divide it by operating assets. And that gives us our investment turnover. And we can take our operating income and divide it by sales. And that gives us our return on sales. So by doing this, by breaking it down into smaller components, we can actually out identify which things we need to increase or decrease to increase our return on investments. So now let's have a look at the example. Um, and I've put the formula up here. Where, and this is um, comprehensive exercise one on page 603 of your textbook. So we've got the operating assets for two businesses, two divisions, um, and in New Zealand and Australia, and the operating income. So for New Zealand, and this is all um, in Australian dollars, so we don't have to worry about converting. We've got um, operating income of 500,000 divided by average operating assets gives us 25%. And return on investment, we've got 60,000 for the Australian operation divided by 200,000. So the return on investment looks much better in, for the Australian operation than it does for the New Zealand operation. So we can decompose this doing the DuPont analysis. So here we're looking just at the New Zealand example. And um, we've picked up the sales figure of 500, 5 million. So we've got the return on sales. Um, that 500,000, which was the um, operating income divided by sales, gives us our return on sales of 10%. And then our investment um, turnover is the, the 5 million divided by the 2 million of average operating assets, gives us 2.5 times. And then we multiply these two, so we end up with the 25%. So we can see that the return on investment for the New Zealand operation can be increased by increasing the sales of 5 million, decreasing the costs, which would increase the income, and decreasing the investment in operating assets. OK, so increasing sales and decreasing costs, generally pretty good, um, as long as we don't decrease costs so much that um, we're selling a substandard product and no one wants to buy it. But you've got to be careful about things like decreasing investment in operating assets what is that going to do to the business? 
What's the problem with decreasing investment in operating assets? Question over to you too. I can see you both typing an answer. Yes, not keeping up with advan um, advancements in technology. Business can't operate in the same way. Yes, that can be a real problem. So you've got to be careful about if you're measuring a performance for an investment centre on return on investment, you need to do something to ensure that the investment in operating assets is meets the strategic goals of the organisation. Okay, so that's return on investment and that gives you some idea about the problem there. And now we've got exercise 616 and now you need to calculate the return on investment. And I've um, put the formula there. So what's the operating income? Let's, let's just stop sharing that and share my screen. Okay, so operating income is going to be it's going to be sales minus variable costs minus traceable fixed costs which is 600,000. So return on income is operating income divided by average operating assets. So what is the average operating assets? Yes, you've done very well. What? Oh, you've worked it out, 20%. Very good, Milad. So, we've got So ROI is going to be the 600 divided by the 300, 3 million, which is, if we put that at percentage, 20%. Okay, so that's return on investment. So now let's go back to the 
PowerPoint and We're now going to look at some of the advantages and disadvantages of this. Come on, very slow. Okay. So um, obviously we've picked up the big disadvantage. It discourages managers from investing in projects that reduce a decision division's return on investment, even if that would improve the overall company investment. One of the other, uh, can you hear me? Alicia, can you hear me? Okay, not sure what the problem was. Um, okay. Um, one of the big problems with it is that it doesn't incorporate measures of risk. So to really understand how well someone is operating and making decisions, you really want to know um, how, the, um, how they're coping with the risks of the business. And obviously, managers, managers may only consider short-term impacts. Some, um, some advantages by, of the return on investment is that it can reduce the tendency to over-invest in projects. You've got to try and manage the, the problems of under-investment or over-investment. Obviously, it's going to motivate managers to increase sales and decrease costs. So they're, they're the basic advantages and disadvantages <coughs> of return on investment. You've also got to consider that the numbers we're using are accounting numbers. Um, so it could be possible for um, a manager to understate the assets that are um, that are used in measuring the ROI. So they can do this by perhaps manipulating the depreciation um, by lowering the depreciation or over or um, increasing the depreciation there's an understatement of assets that can have an impact on the, the measurement of the return on investment. Also, if you misallocate overhead, that can also um, distort your profit figures. So you've got to be aware that managers may be in a, a position to manipulate the accounting numbers that are used to calculate the return on investment. The next measure that we're going to look at is residual income. So this measures the dollar amount of profits above what we say is a minimum required rate of return. So the residual income is the operating income less the minimum required operating income given the segment's investment in assets. So it's simply operating income minus required rate of return times the operating, average, uh, operating assets. And the larger that is, the better the, better the responsibility centre 
was seen to be. So here again, we've got the example of the New Zealand and Australian businesses. We've got the average operating income and we've got the required rate of return. So for New Zealand, it was 200,000 and for Australia, it was 20,000. Excuse me, I just need to take a glass of water. Okay, so we calculate the, um, the residual income. So we've got our operating income and our required rate of return is for New Zealand is 200,000. So the residual income is 300,000. And for Australia, we've got the 20,000 and the residual income is 40,000. So can you see an obvious profit, uh, sorry, an obvious problem with this measure? Um, so Australia had more income, what was the Australian income? Go back a page. Australia had only $60,000 worth of operating income. Yeah. Okay, that's good. Yes. If we're comparing the managers of these two um, of these two divisions, which manager would you think is the better one? New Zealand, because he's He's making more. But when we did the return on investment calculation, New Zealand was actually operating at 25% and Australia was operating at 30% return on investment. So the problem with residual income is that it doesn't, it's really not possible to compare subunits or departments of different sizes. The manager of the Australian operation might actually be doing much better than the manager of the New Zealand operation, but because they've got less invested, it, it's, it's really not possible to compare the two using the residual income measure. Now, do you understand that? Great, Alicia. Yeah. That's right. So you can't compare um, two departments where you've got different levels of investment using this, this figure. So that's a really important thing to understand. So now calculate the residual income in this example. And I won't go over to the to the spreadsheet to do it. I think you can do it quite well.
we've got a required rate of return of 15%. You've worked out the operating income and you know what the average assets are. So what do you think the residual income is? A hundred and fifty thousand. That's right, Alicia. So we've got our operating income. Yeah, very good, Melad. We've got our operating income of six hundred thousand, and from that we deduct the fifteen percent times the three million, which is four hundred and fifty thousand, giving us a residual income of a hundred and fifty thousand. Okay. So, one advantage over the residual income is it um, reduces the incentive for managers to make project investment decisions based on um, return on investment. The, there are lots of disadvantages though. Larger subunits are more likely to have larger residual incomes. Um, managers may cut costs on uh, still may, may cut costs on items of long-term benefit to obtain short-term gains. And um, managers have an incentive to set their required rate of return too low. Uh, and, and this is where you need to have a system that sets the required rate of return um, for the whole organisation that's not necessarily controlled by the managers who are going to be evaluated on that required rate of return. Okay, so that's residual income. We now move on to economic value added. So this tries to make adjustments to reduce some of the disadvantages produced by residual income. So we're using a different definition of income. It's adjusted as adjusted after tax operating income. Required rate of return is the weighted average cost of capital. Um, and the um, operating assets is defined as adjusted total assets, less current liabilities. Um, we're using after tax operating income here because then it provides some incentive for managers to reduce their taxes. So let's see an example of how this is calculated. So it's adjusted after-tax operating income, less the weighted average cost of capital. So this is the cost of capital for the whole organisation. Um, and it's, it's it, when you do your finance subject, you'll see that this is, that they'll take shareholders' funds, they'll take um, capital that's come in from, um, from loans, and they'll take they'll take the, um, the cost of each of those so you end up with a weighted average cost of capital and, and that's multiplied by adjusted total assets minus current liabilities. So let's see how we calculate this. So here we've got still the same two companies, New Zealand and Australia, two departments. We've got the weighted average cost of capital. In New Zealand it's 7.2%, in Australia it's 10%. We've got the current liabilities and we've got the after-tax operating income. So now let's look at the EVA for New Zealand. So we've got the after-tax operating income 
and we've got the weighted average co cost of capital, which is 7.2%, times the total assets of 2 million, less current liabilities, that's 142,560, which gives us um, an economic value added of 157,440. And in for the Australian operation, we've got the after-tax operating income, weighted average cost of capital is 10%. We take our current liabilities from our total assets, and we get 19,500. So our economic value added is $20,500 for Australia. What can you see are some of the problems here? Any ideas? Remember, these are two departments of one company. Um, you may not have spent much time on calculating the weighted average cost of capital, but um, it, it's done for the whole company. Yes, different weighted average cost of capital, but the same company. So what's happening here? Again, we've got the issue about valuing the assets, what cost, what value, yeah, um, and we've got different assets. So there are still problems in using this economic value added approach. So now let's go to this data that we've been working on, um, now calculate the economic value added here. Now we've got the marginal tax rate is 36% and we had 600,000. I might actually do this on the spreadsheet. So let me just stop sharing this. Um, spreadsheet. Share my screen. Okay. So to calculate the EVA, when we don't have the profit after tax, we're told that the marginal rate is 36%. So our adjusted after tax income is going to be The 600,000 times 1 minus the tax rate which gives us 384 and the um, the adjusted total assets minus adjusted total assets is the 
3 million minus the 200,000. So our EVA is going to be 12% times the adjusted total assets, which is 48,000. So what are some of the advantages and disadvantages of the economic value added model? Um, the advantages is that it personalises the measures for each entity by just taking into account the tax rates and the, um, the, the different um, the, the different net assets. Um, so it does provide uh, a specific incentive that aligns goals of the managers with the owners. The problems are with the cost of capital and the how you adjust the assets figure. That's That can be a you know, a difficult thing. Um, what do you take off the assets? What things don't you think are appropriate should be there? So lots of people make different adjustments to the total assets figure and because companies are so complex um, to do an economic value added calculation they often get external consultants to actually go through the accounts and work out what they should be doing. So that could be quite expensive and time consuming. Okay, um, we could go through exercise 16, 18 and just finish off working through that exercise. And what we then, what we can do then is um, compare a couple of segments. So we'll We'll do that, I think, to finish off today because we've still got a few minutes left up our sleeve. Okay, so we'll go to 16, 18. And here we've got three different segments of businesses. We've got pre-tax operating income, current assets, long-term liabilities, and um, and we've got a tax rate of point three and the weighted average cost of capital for each is, oh, okay, so let's just put those as percentages, okay. So let's see how we do this. Which has the highest EVA? So let's look at segment A. So segment A, we've got 
after tax income. So let's go. So this is pre tax. So that's that time times one minus the tax rate. minus the weighted average cost of capital, which is 10%, times, so we've got assets, so let's go, plus that, minus, oh, minus that, and that should give it to me. So we end up with 2 million for segment A. So let's see how we do it for segment B, actually, if I just Copy that across. I could do that, and I've done it. <laughs> that was a cheat, wasn't it? Um, so, which segment is the better one? C, that's right, segment C. It didn't have as much profit as segment A. It had more than segment B. It had the same current assets as segment A. Um, it had didn't have as many long-term assets. And it had a, a medium current liabilities. So it's quite interesting, isn't it, how that worked out. And you can see that because Segment A got a bit more operating income, but it had a huge amount of assets, so it really wasn't generating the appropriate rate of return on those assets. Whereas Segment C was generating a much better return on the assets that it had. So we looked at three ways of measuring the performance of investment centres and therefore the import performance of the management of those investment centres. But there are problems with all of those measures and a lot of the problems are because we're, we're just using numbers and that doesn't necessarily measure how well the um, how well the managers are meeting the goals of the business, and next week we look at um, balance scorecard, which is one way of measuring how well the managers meet the goals of the business. Any questions before we finish off? And a reminder, 